as we have reached in Hebrews 6, 1 through 2, we're talking about the doctrines, our basic doctrines of what we follow and what we believe. This is revealed as the apostles walked out what they knew in the life of Jesus and what they knew from the Old Testament, and the new was given. And so Paul, by revelation, got this doctrine of what we have in Christ. And it's, it's so awesome because we're faith people and we're doctrine people. We're filled with the Spirit and we preach the Word of God. They're inseparable. And to not have one or the other is to not have all of God in your church because you're supposed to have the manifestation of the Spirit. You're supposed to know who you are in Christ and you're supposed to see the glory of the Father. You're supposed to have the Trinity in your church and in your life. Amen? That's the whole council. And he reveals it, and it's an awesome revealing. It's an awesome revelation. This is what makes things exciting. Church should not be predictable or, or boring where you fall asleep and wake up 10, 15 minutes later, and it's right you know, where you expect it to be. Jesus had many interruptions. He was going one way, and, and two blind men cried out, Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, this is what do you want? We're blind, we want to see. And they got what they asked for. And they greatly praised and worshipped the Lord. Jesus had a mission. And people pulled on Him. And He gave to them. And He gave to them. But He fully trusted His Father. Hebrews 6. I'm glad God is so graceful. I'm going to be talking on a subject such as eternal judgment today. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Hebrews 6. 1-2. Therefore, leaving the principles or the beginnings of the doctrines of Christ, let us go into perfection, maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. There's nothing wrong between you and God. When you're in Christ, dead works, things that come against your mind, they tell you something. If you've got something that's condemning you, come to the Lord. There's no guilt here. And faith towards God. We are faith people and we have His faith what He tells you to do, He'll equip you for. The assignment, each one of you has an assignment. Each one of you is to aid a work of God, to aid a church, to aid a people. You're not just sitting here just to be sitting here to do your service to God because I went to Sunday and now I'm good. You live this. This is, this is the rally point. You know? And then out there, you are led. I want you to pursue the kingdom this way. I want you to pursue the kingdom that way. Of doctrines of baptisms. Three baptisms for the new believer. Seven altogether, but three that apply to this age. When you get baptized into Christ, when you ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, and you're put into the body of Christ. Water baptism, which is a type and shadow of Christ raising from the dead and you raising with Him. And the Holy Spirit being baptized with the very power and the manifestation of God. And resurrection from the dead. <laughs> That's scriptural. You know you can raise the dead? Do you know that? The power of God in you will raise the dead. Same spirit. And of eternal judgment. This, if it were up to me, and it's not, but if it were up to me, I would avoid this subject, but you need to hear it. Eternal judgment. It's not something... See, when I go out and minister to the people... When I go out street witness, I don't tell, the most of the time, I've never told anyone, hey, you're going to hell. I tell them, hey, Jesus loves you. He died for you. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Don't you know all the good things you have in Christ? If you just believe, if you'll just receive, I'm begging you, be reconciled to God. But you know who Jesus came against? The religious people. And that's when he taught eternal judgment. He said, woe unto you Pharisees. You know what woe means in Greek? Damn. He was saying, you hypocrites. You damned hypocrites. That's what he was saying. It was so strong because he felt so passionately. It was a curse word. That's what woe means. Jesus was so graceful the people living in sin. But those who were of religious, and you understand in the last days, persecution 
is not really, I mean, it's going to be some outside of the church, but most of it's going to come with, from within. Why? Religion. It happened with Jesus. Most of his persecution, in fact, the ones that, that crucified him came from within. It's going to happen the same way again. Persecution is the religious leaders coming against the move of the Spirit because they don't understand it. Stephen in Acts chapter 7 said, You stiff-necked and hard heart of hearts, you who always resist the Holy Ghost. See, the Holy Spirit must be free to move in this church and in our life. Strong stuff. He must be free to move. Why? Because the greatest work on the earth today is the work of the Holy Ghost. The Father sent Him because of the Son. And Jesus told, hey, there's another one coming. He's a comforter, a counselor, an intercessor. One that's going to be bearing your weaknesses and pain. Without Him, you can't even do the works of Christ. You can't even have revelation knowledge of the Word. Without Him, there's no light. You're just reading a dead letter. This is what changes us. No, the earth, you know, the church, it needs change. The people, hallelujah, they need to see something refreshing, experience his life. Amen? Eternal judgment. Jesus put it this way. I'll read it to you. Uh, Matthew 13, turn there. Matthew 13, 24 through 43. Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sows good seed in his field. But while the men sleep, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung and up brought forth fruit, then there appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, did this not know thou good seed in thy field, and now there is tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. When Jesus gave the parable of the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed and being sown into the ground, it starts out very small, which it did, and then it quickly grew up to be the biggest thing in all the earth. And he said the fowls of the air will come underneath and rest in its branches. That is represented by the powers of darkness. Put yourself in, in the devil's thinking. If I can't beat them, I'm going to join them. I'm going to weaken them from within and remove the spirit and teach them traditions of men. Because if he can remove the spirit of God, then it's not really a church. He said, an enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then what we go and gather them up? And he said, no, lest while you gather them up, you root also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. That's the end of the age. And in the time the harvest, I will say to the reapers or the angels, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them. Yikes. But gather them the wheat into my barn. Many people think of God as a boy or a man with a magnifying glass and we are his ants. I will choose to burn this people today and not these people. That's not how it is. In fact, that's the farthest thing from God you can imagine. You see, in the beginning, Adam and Eve, and I believe it's in Psalms chapter 8, they were clothed with the glory of God. I mean, they were like God. They were carbon copies of God Himself. With one difference, they were submitted to Him. He gave them dominion over everything He had. He gave them dominion over everything. He said, I've created this earth, now it's yours. You just follow my leading. They didn't have a system of thinking of right and wrong. They weren't, that was a lower level of thinking of right and wrong. They obeyed and they had the glory of God upon them. That's why when they ate, they looked at their body, were naked. They no longer had that clothing. They realized something. They went down to reasoning. Understand? And so, when a person messes up, after they come to Christ, it's very easy for that person to reason. That's not what you're supposed to do. Or even people who reason right and wrong understand there's no ordinance of commandment. There's no Ten Commandments against you anymore. That was nailed to the cross. Jeremiah 31. 
Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 31. See, the prophets, the Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would prophesy about Christ, the one coming. Christ was in the Old Testament, types and shadows. And the fulfillment of it came in the New Testament. In fact, His blood brought in the New Testament. And the New Testament really didn't start until He said it was finished and the days of the book of Acts began. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the day comes, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, praise God, and with the house of Judah, which means praise. Israel means laughter. Judah means praise. Not according to the covenant that I make with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. With my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. Put it this way. So God tells Moses, Go into the mount. I'm going to lead you. My glory is going to be there. I'm going to write to you a commandment. You're going to be up there for 40 days. And as I said before, I seriously doubt Moses looked at his watch and was like, oh my gosh, it's been 40, you know, it's 40 days. Lord, hurry hurry up. No, he was in awe of God's glory and his presence when he came down from the mount. And then he sinned by getting angry and throwing the Ten Commandments and had to go up another 40 days, and this time God said, you write it this time. And he wrote it. It's called the Law of Moses. They answered to a man. And yet God is saying by the prophet, I'm going to make a new covenant with them. I'm a husband to them, but they haven't even been keeping my law. They couldn't. But this, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law, not a man's law, in their inward part. I will write it in their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They'll no longer be a people of Moses. They'll be a people of God. And they shall teach (laughs) no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know you the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, And I will what? Forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The sacrifices they did was a temporary fix. The disease was still there, but they were quarantined until the cure could come, Jesus. See, this is where grace, and this is along the lines of eternal judgment. In that last day, God's going to deal with the goats and with the sheep. With the sheep, they're already going to heaven. But with the goats, He's going to say, why didn't you accept my son? Why didn't you accept Jesus? And they'll give every excuse. And with their reasoning, that's the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. With their reasoning, they may have some very good excuses, but none of them are going to matter. And you see, when you take it out of the reasoning factor, and just that, that Jesus, by His work, brought us salvation... And it's not based off of mine. And it's not based off my strength. And it's not based off of my spirit, but His. You see, Jesus was 100% man because He stripped Himself of His glory. And 100% God because He was at without sin. And He wasn't under the law of Moses. He was leading a life that we are to lead now because we are empowered by His Spirit. He says, what about the things I've been dealing with my whole life? What about the things I'm addicted to that I shouldn't be addicted to? I know they're wrong. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Verse 16 says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And he goes on to label the the works of the flesh. In verse 19, what are they? Adultery, fornication, uncleansedness, lavocationness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, seditions, hearsay, envying, murder, drunkenness, revealings against such. But then what does he say afterwards? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Verse 23, against such there is no law. What? No law of Moses. We have a choice to dip ourselves in the very presence of God, to dip ourselves and be submerged by the Spirit of God, where the law has no power over us. The law can't say anything against us. And then it's not by your works. And these things just fall off. Let me put it to you this way 
And I love this testimony. I love saying it. There was a lady in my grandfather's church. She would come Sunday drunk every Sunday. And everyone knew it. You know, as a pastor, you would think he'd point her out and kick her out of the church. Well, my grandfather asked the Lord, what do I do with her? Do I kick her out? He said, no, don't even talk to her. Just let her keep coming. One year went by of her doing that. She came up to my grandfather. She said, I can't do it. He says, what can't you do? He says, I can't do it anymore. I can't drink anymore. God's too big in my life. It fell off. With loving arms and compassion, he pushed the thing that didn't belong from the inside out. And that's how you do it. That's how you do it. When you learn how to minister by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit and let, and let His life-giving love, His life-giving Spirit minister to you, things get easy because it's no longer by your strength. There's times of refreshing that's in the presence of the Lord. But He's giving a warning This is what Jesus was saying. Verse 31, Another parable he put forth, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of a mustard seed, which a man took, this is still Matthew 13, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed the least of all seeds, but when it grows, it's the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree, and the birds, or another gospel says, the fowls of the airs come in and lodge underneath the branches thereof. Another parable is spanked unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal to the whole was leaven. And these things Jesus said unto the multitude in parables. Without a parable, he did not speak unto them, but it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, Out of my mouth in parables, he speaks to them. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the earth. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went to his house, and the disciples came to him, saying, Declare unto us, what is the parable of the tares of the field? He answered and said unto him, He that soweth the seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, and the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels." As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man sent forth His angels, and they shall gather out of the kingdom all things that offered to them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus put it this way as He talked about hell. He brought them outside of Jerusalem and showed them a a place where they threw out the trash and that was being burned. He says, look, this is what hell is like. All men are created equal in the, in the face of God, no matter their, their defects in the natural or the mind. All men are created equal. But their ideas are not equal. What they believe are not equal. If you believe in Jesus, as we, as we said, believe on me. Let me teach you. Let me build you up. And so there's going to be people that have served in the church that never gave their life to Jesus. There's going to be churches that are religious that will not let the Holy Spirit move. This brings change. This brings the greatest mercies you could ever imagine. The Lord is always before you. He's always enabling you. But you see, the enemy is so crafty in his deception that he'll take the traditions of men. Matthew chapter 15 An elder came up to Jesus who was offended at Jesus and says, why don't your disciples wash their hands as is the custom? He says, why don't you follow the tradition of our fathers? You know what Jesus said? Why do you basically make void the power of God by the traditions of men? (laughs) There's freedom in the Spirit of God. There's freedom. You know someone could come up here have face tattoos, have neck tattoos, and be so full of God Himself that He changes the world? And who's going to look on the outward appearance? Who cares? Who cares? Someone who used to be a homosexual, someone who used to be a lesbian, and now they're on fire for God? They're going to reach people you can't. And all you've got to do is say, Lord, I want to know You more. God honors hunger. The greatest moves I've had of my life of the Spirit when I was was crying out to know Him more. Fire as my head was lit on fire. And and, and it's like my whole body was just on fire of the Holy Ghost because I was crying, I want to know You. 
I want to know you. You read Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want or shall not be in want of anything. Amen? Hallelujah. Romans 14. God will examine every person's life. And this is a good thing. You see, embrace change. See, people don't want to change because they get stuck in what they know. You see, the Lord, we want to speak smooth words to people all the time because we love them. If you truly love someone, there's going to be times when your words are not so smooth. Proverbs, it talks about the woundings of a friend are faithful, but (laughs) the, the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Jesus commended Peter for saying, but who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Son of God. You're the, you're, you're the Christ. He says, blessed are you, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then he talked about how he would die and be crucified before the world. And he said, Lord, pity yourself. These things shouldn't happen to you. And he said, Satan, get behind me. You see, we need God's guidance in our life because if you'll listen to Him, He'll teach you how to be led of His Spirit and you'll recognize the difference between good and evil. See, the world has twisted everything into a gray area. You know, what's good for you is good for you. If, if what's sin uh, is it's sin. You know, what you believe is what you believe. And God's saying, you, know, you believe the way I believe. John fourteen fifteen says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But the commandment of love, the commandment of the Spirit, Jesus always followed the leading of the Holy Ghost and He walked in the light. During the time of Jesus, God sent His Son at the perfect opportunity. It's when the powers of darkness have come to a peak. It's when religion has crept in through the synagogue. And when everything was set at perfect stage, God sent His Son at the perfect time. They couldn't even recognize Jesus. Except for John the Baptist, who was full of the Holy Spirit anyway. John the Baptist recognized Him and submitted to Him. And now we see the same thing happening. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything repeats itself. There's no new tricks. Now we see the same thing happening in our age, in our generation. Powers of darkness coming to a peak. Deception, false prophets, false apostles coming into the church. People who just watch YouTube pastors and have no other pastor underneath them are open for deception. You see, the doctrines of Christ will keep you stable and the faith of God will keep you believing into the realm of the unseen. See, we are faith people, but we are doctrine people. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, yet we're word people. They never were ever meant to be separated. Yet men... And his unlearning and his quickness to go and start his own work, the kingdom of God, or really the body of Christ, has been divided. But true unity and an awakening and a revival unites the people. This is what the enemy will fight tooth and nail for. He doesn't care if you go to church and sing songs about Jesus. But he cares about you being on fire for God and affecting and coming against the kingdom of darkness. Because you have authority as you submit. If you can bow your knee before the Lord, you can stand in front of anyone. The more you submit to the Lord, here, let's look at it. James 4. God wants no one to go to hell. In fact, it was made for the devil and his angels. It was never meant for man. In fact, to, there's no way I could adequately describe how merciful God is. I'm experiencing that every day. I'm experiencing that. See, that's what we're meant, we're meant to experience God. It goes beyond our understanding. I'm going to learn of His new mercies and His new graces next year. I'm going to look back and say, man, God's really been merciful to me. Has equipped me. Thank you, Jesus. And we're to be like Him. James 4, hallelujah. Let's start in verse 6. 
Actually, let's start in verse 5. James 4, 5. Do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth the envy? What does that mean? God lusts is the envy after you. He wants all your attention is what He wants. He's envious over you. He doesn't want you to spend any time in the realm of darkness. He wants you all for Himself. Verse 6. But He giveth more grace where He says, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, so you submit yourself to God. Then you can resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nine to God, and he'll draw nine to you. If I'm the best minister in the world, I still can't make you submit to the Lord. It's up to you. You have to choose. You see, I can have the best gimmicks in the world, the, the smoke machine. I can have the best lighting. I could have where, let's say this whole church was made of LED lights and everything just lit up. That'd be awesome. But if I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, I myself don't become magnetic. I myself don't draw people to Christ. And it becomes a man's church. But if I bow my knee before Him and draw close to Him, then that presence on me him on me will draw others to Christ. I mean, people should come around you and say, there's something different about you. There's something different among you, among other Christians, among other ministers. Because I've truly submitted my life to the Lord. From what I know, amen? You're always gaining more knowledge, more light as you walk in that light, as you obey it. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But can you imagine how much trust and love it takes the Father to let us choose that, knowing that there's an enemy out there? He has so much faith in you. He believes in you more than you could ever believe in yourself. There's so much grace and compassion. The church of 1 Corinthians, as I said, the Holy Spirit will temper you. He'll search the church for weakness. He'll search your life for weakness and say, by love and grace and say, hey, get these things out of here. Submit yourself to me and I'm going to help you even get them out of your life. The church at 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, 2, and 3, it, it really gets into it. They had the gifts of the Spirit. They were the most ones that had, they desired it the most. But you also know what was happening? And you hear this commonly reported. It seems like they were the worst church. no. They had the light manifesting within them, and the light was pointing out the dark places in their life. The other churches were probably the same. But you know what they didn't have? The love of God. Not the way they should have. Because you can read 1 Corinthians 8 1, it says, Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. See, this is what I want for this church is that the Holy Spirit just brings out the impurities in us in love, embrace that person that's in that sin and, and draw them out of it. That's what mom and pop good one. How many have heard of the good ones? Amen? The good ones trained and taught, uh, even partnered with Kenneth Hagin. Taught my grandfather what he knew. But they had such moves and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but they had so much love that these things, these sins would come out and the people would just love them instead of pointing the finger. And it brought change. That's what the church is meant to be. See, the church, I minister primarily to save people. We, through this union, will go out and bring others to Christ. And yes, God will draw. He will bring the increase. He will give us witty inventions. In fact, Monday, uh, I talked to the bank, and they're going to let me put up for the rest of the month a table... Uh, talking about the church, free of charge. Amen? That's a good witness. Your life may be the only Bible anyone ever reads. Maybe the only epistle. You are a living epistle. You are a written of God. You see, this, this Bible really never ended. You are adding to it as you get revelation from the Lord. <sighs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans 14, 10 through 12. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 
The judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, is where rewards are given out. What have you done in the name of Jesus? Did you fulfill the call? We are kingdom business people, kingdom minded. We are fulfilling a kingdom. God is our employer. As I said, He tells you where to go, what to do, how to do it, what attitude you're to have, what time you're going to show up, and you need to show up on time. He says, let me <laughs> submit to me. I'll tell you who to submit to. You see, you, authority gives you the right to use power. He gave us power from on high with the Holy Spirit, but until you submit to authority, you really have no right to use that power. Amen? You have to submit to the Almighty, and then you'll be able to use that power. Well, here's the thing. There are people who go out and make their own ministries and have converts. But when you submit to the authority, you're going to make children. You're going to make disciples. Because those converts might be saved 10 years, but then the falling away because this minister didn't answer the call because he did his own thing. What are those people going to do now? Children is what we make. Disciples is what we make. You're rewarded for you answering the call, not you establishing your own. Now, we're all called to win souls. So as you go, you'll be an example to the world. Amen? But God will put you in a church to submit to authority so that you can aid in that work. Amen? You see, I need help in this church. God is equipping little by little. I need help to, as God speaks to me, one vision. And I'm faithful in that. I'll get another. I'll get another leading. And we all come together and we all reap reward, but I'm the first one to get corrected too. I'm the first one. I'm the one that goes before you guys and answers to the Lord for how I've been training you and treating you. So why are your people doing this? Well, um, you know. <laughs> I says, you've been rewarded for this. Thank you, good and faithful servant. Amen. And so then this takes the focus off of me. Because I will answer. Hallelujah. You are rewarded for faithfulness. Hallelujah. So the judgment seat of Christ is for everyone that believes in Jesus. No matter what, even if all your works get burned up, you're still going to heaven. Praise God. That's mercy, is it not? That's mercy. And heaven itself would just be worth it just to get out of hell, but just to spend time with God. Here's your get out of hell free card. If you serve me well, there'll be far more riches than you can imagine. Ooh. Ephesians chapter 1 says we are blessed with all, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In the field, work in the field He's told you to, to do, and you're going to discover the giftings, you're going to discover the calling, you're going to discover your value. That's relationship, Amen. I love, I love uh, services where we whoop and holler. I really do. I love services where we just rejoice and we rejoice and we rejoice. I love services that edify. But sometimes we need salt. And sometimes we need to evaluate our life. Am I doing and am I living the way God wants me to live? You care about your children. God cares more about them than you do. But God also cares for you and that He wants you to live the way you're supposed to live. There's a lot of backslidden people out there. A lot of backslidden Christians. A lot of prodigal sons. A lot of prodigal daughters. They got hurt by looking at how ministers handled themselves. Or maybe that they were PKs. They got hurt by, by pastors not living the way they should. I know a few, very dear to me, still not in the ministry. I'll put it this way. Everybody, everybody, no exception, makes mistakes. Everybody. Did David not make mistakes? Killed a woman's husband so he could marry her? That's a big mistake. But how quick was he to repent? And it did cost him something, but how quick was he to repent? And even in a system of the Old Testament as he had back then, God restored him and says the seed, meaning Jesus, would come through your bloodline. And through, because Jesus had the blood of David in him, he also had the blood of God in him. And through Christ, David's 
bloodline and kingdom is established for every kingdom. Think about that. God put a man, David, who, who messed up and sinned and is represented from the kingdom of heaven that will never end. God identifies you so much with Himself that you're His hands, you're His feet, you're His oracle, you're His mouthpiece in the earth. He says, you're my representative. Wherever you go, I'll go. I'll lead you. Whatever you do, I will lead you. That's your unity in Christ. There is no shame. There's no guilt. There's nothing. Literally, there's nothing the devil can do. If you stay close to God, he can't get that close to you. The devil can't get that close to you. But the temptations, the sin, they just fall off. It's like, it's, I just, I'm just pure. I just am. I'm like the I am. I just am in him. There's no sin in my life. I don't even desire it anymore. Why? You've been awakened. You see with a pure heart. (laughs) The great white throne judgment, Revelations 20, verse 11. Revelations 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand, stand before God. And the books were open. Another book was opened, and it was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in it. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. People have had experiences of going to hell, but that's not where it stops. At the end of days, before, before the millennial, people will be drawn out that are in hell. And as I said before, they'll give account of what they've done and why they have not accepted Christ. And then they're put into a lake of fire. This is different from hell. This is worse. You, you can't imagine. And this is why we have to preach the gospel, because people will go to this place. That's why I say repent. Repent means turn away from, change your mind. For the kingdom of God is at hand. He's well on the earth. His mercies are everlasting. Even David said in Psalms 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. And he goes on to say, Who remembers your iniquities no more? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? You know, have you guys ever watched Jesse Duplantis' Close Encounters of the God Kind? It's a very good. You know what was awesome? Is that when he met Jesus, and he said, You know, the cross was not my worst day. You know what my worst day is going to be? When I have to wipe my own tears and remember no more the creation that I love that has gone off into hell. He says, I dread that day. I dread it. And Jesus was saying this to Jesse. He was crying. He says, I dread this day, Jesse. I dread it. But my word is final. People are looking so much for the genuine. They hate the hypocrisy of of religion. They hate it. So does God. So do I. They're hypocrites. And very plainly, Jesus said, Whoa, damn you hypocrites, is what he said. Because he felt so passionately. He says, You travel great distances. You'll go against across the seas and make one convert. And make him twice the son of hell that you are. When Jesus ate with the sinners, Jesus, let's say Jesus probably went to the bars and and told them his goodness and love for them. If you saw a true Christian that was on fire for Christ, 
he probably wouldn't follow very many traditions of the church. Most people won't even know the Holy Spirit if he walked down the aisle with a red hat. <laughs> Psalm 62, verse 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou rendereth every man according to his work. This is a mind blown. The mercies of God. You're not judged according to what you do in the flesh. No longer are your sins before you. Yet those who aren't in Christ, what do they have? The law. They're still under the Old Testament. When Christ died, it was a great divide. The Spirit was free. It ripped the veil and it left. Praise God. And then the promise of the Father came down and filled them and they began to prophesy. They began to speak. They began to praise God. And 3,000 souls that saw a genuine move of God were added to the church. Do you want to be tempered? Do you want the Holy Spirit to examine your life? To find weaknesses in it? So that you can become a vessel of honor prepared into every good work? I do. I do. In fact, the Lord will speak to me first. Daniel, you're the minister. You're the pastor. Get on this anvil. <laughs> Let me temper you. Yes, Lord. And He removes the things in my life. And as so goes the minister, so goes the church. I'll tell you something, guys. And I can't say it enough. Don't sit on the sidelines. Come to God. Come to Him with all your mess ups. Don't even think. Just, just come. Don't try to clean yourself up. You can't. We try to clean our fish before we catch them. You can't. Just come and He, He will do it. He will do it. It's that easy.